So good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be uh, with you and share uh, what we are doing in the Informa Coalition. Uh, you already heard the name of my presentation. So I just want to start with saying, if you want to achieve your goal, do not focus on them. So that goes uh, against everything we know uh, that's ever said about setting goals. So whenever, wherever anyone is uh, talking about goals, they say you have to pick up what's on your mind that's going to do uh, and write it down, set your goal, have a sort of checklist, go over and over and again, and then you achieve your goal. Actually, I learned that this is not how we are going to achieve our goals through uh, the course of my uh, life. As a uh, doctor, as a patient, as a and as a caregiver. So I have three hats, uh, so I can see the, 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 the issue from different perspectives. So we're talking about patient empowerment and uh, I was in the professional uh, field since 25 years, and in 15 years I'm in the advocacy world, and we're still talking about uh, empowering patients. And yet, not a uh, uh, result that we are convinced that uh, we're at the final stage. The reason is that we always say that patients are at the center of everything, uh, but we don't have a common understanding of the stakeholders that we are uh, having the patient centricity. So this is, as uh, everybody knows, uh, Albert Einstein. In 1947, he was giving lectures at the University of Oxford, and after an examination, uh, he was just walking with his assistant, and the assistant was a little bit shocked. And he said, he turned to, to Professor uh, Albert Einstein and said, Professor, uh, excuse me of saying this, but uh, you have asked the same questions last year to the same uh, class. Is there a mistake? Uh, Einstein said, no, uh, it's the same questions. But how come, the, the, the assistant said, I mean, you have asked the same questions. Einstein replied, uh, the questions were the same, but the answers changed. It is the same for patient centricity. So what we know of uh, back in uh, two decades uh, in terms of patient centricity is not uh, the same as we uh, understand today. So as Lymphoma Coalition, we decided to redefine the patient centricity. I'm just going to go uh, over uh, the terminology. Patient centricity is engaging individuals diagnosed with lymphoma and their caregivers in all aspects of their care, tailoring support with the understanding that every patient is unique with a different set of emotions, and uh, that needs to be changed over time. Giving the lymphoma patients and those uh, close to them a voice so that the focus of their care and their needs are included throughout the shared decision-making process. A willingness to listen and hear the persons affected by lymphoma in a way that uh, respects their input, their dignity, and their intelligence and capacity for making informed decisions about their care and uh, impact on their life. And finally, patient organizations are included as active partners and conduit of the patient needs at every stage of patient care development, including psychosocial, clinical, research, protocol development, and ultimately uh, being seen as an integral supportive service for patients and caregivers. So as you can see, the patient centricity as a block is held by these columns, inclusiveness, partnering, sharing goals, transparency, and empowerment. And what's missing is the golden circle. As everybody knows uh, what they're doing, but some know how they're doing, and very little know uh, why they're doing what they're doing. 
A couple of years ago, when I was flying uh, long distance, I got this book, and this is a very good book uh, by Marshall Goldsmith, saying that what got you here won't get you there. That means that we're doing the advocacy to empower patients, but what we did uh, in the previous year won't uh, get us uh, to the next level. So Lymphoma Coalition uh, is an uh, umbrella force uh, of, uh, of uh, 48 countries and 71 uh, members established in 2002 but incorporated in 2010. Uh, we are not actually dealing with the individual patients but the patient organizations in general in different countries. Uh, we have patient leaders in all blood cancers. We share best practice and resources. Uh, we actually think globally, but act locally. Uh, we have uh, 650,000 plus plus uh, database, so we can diffuse the information very easily through our uh, connections. So we exist to transform the lymphoma landscape Ensuring uh, patient centricity is defined by people affected by lymphoma to improve patient outcomes across all uh, health system decisions. So we have a couple of uh, resources uh, that the Lymphoma Coalition has created, a robust uh, high value resources and assets that have currently been uh, underutilized. That's a patient survey that I'm gonna talk to you uh, in a couple of minutes. Reports, data collection, library resources, standards of excellence. That's, uh, this one is uh, still uh, in the process of developing. Awareness campaigns and digital assets. We also have a life app. I'm not gonna go into the details of the life app because uh, everybody, I mean, it's a trendy to have a life app and it's difficult. It's, it's very expensive and difficult to maintain, but uh, I would like to have your feedbacks on this uh, at the end if it's possible. We have a, a Lymphoma Coalition resource library where we get uh, RSS feeds, uh, more than 100 pieces uh, in different topics like regulatory and reimbursement funding, diagnostic therapies, press releases, abstracts and lymphoma articles, uh, and variety of other things. We have this uh, Lymphoma uh, Coalition global database. And in this database, you can search uh, therapies by countries, by region, by the therapy itself, by the trade names, by the approval status, a stands for approved and T for clinical trials. Uh, you don't see any P here, but P for pending, W for withdrawal, et cetera, et cetera. Regulatory status and reimbursement status is very important as well uh, that you can sort out uh, with the filters. Apart from that, you get the country uh, demographics in this uh, database as well as the lymphoma statistics like incidence, mortality, and prevalence, and those kind of uh, things by country and by, and by region. Uh, and that's very helpful also for the stakeholders like healthcare professionals and, and, and the industry. So you can, as you see, uh, compare within the country or between countries for example, in Germany, you have more than 100 therapies reimbursed for lymphoma, whereas uh, in Serbia, you have uh, half of it. So, I mean, uh, physically, those two countries are not very far away from each other, but uh, in one country, the lymphoma patients are privileged to have at least uh, two times more therapies available. When you look at the number of approved and reimbursed therapies, actually a true measure of access is not the approved therapies. Uh, you can see in, in, in all of these countries, most of the drugs available are approved, but when you, you have to look for the true measurement of access to the reimbursement, uh, which is uh, the light uh, blue thing. And in Latvia, there's a big difference that also shows the, the uh, how healthy of the uh, health care system in that country because there's a huge gap between approved uh, 
therapies with reimbursed therapies. You know that we have more than 80 uh, subtypes in lymphoma, and you can see the subtype therapies in our uh, global database. Uh, you can sort out the clinical trials in each country. We're hoping to have the Greek data uh, very soon uh, with our colleagues uh, coming into the lymphoma coalition, but I'm not going to go to, into details of this. But the only sad thing is that the number of clinical trials uh, being written in the United States exceeds the sum of all European clinical trials. And that's a very sad thing for the European lymphoma patients. So Lymphoma Coalition and its members are well positioned to be the voice of lymphoma patient worldwide, sharing the patient per perspective with all the stakeholders. Actually, we are uh, sort of bridging between the stakeholders because the patients are in the middle. Uh, are at the center of everything. But uh, as an Oxford professor uh, saying, uh, patients are the most underestimated resources in the healthcare system of all times. So we're dealing with the patients, but we're not getting information from the patients as much as we could, which could uh, save uh, a lot of time and energy and, and money, of course. So I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the global service that we do uh, every second year. We started doing this global service uh, firstly in 2008. Uh, and, and in 2016, we had more than 4,000 respondents and nearly 3,000 uh, patients responded from Europe. And when you look at the several uh, feedbacks uh, that I'm going to summarize here, for example, the physical concerns, uh, that affect negatively the quality of life of the lymphoma patients. Fatigue is the most frequent. There are, of course, the other uh, uh, things that also affect the quality of life, uh, of life but not as much as fatigue. Uh, factors affecting well-being is mostly the most frequent is fear of relapse, uh, but all of these things are unmet needs because uh, neither the healthcare professionals nor the service around the, the patient uh, are, are uh, aware of this uh, problem and then helping uh, with the patients. The medical concerns is diverse uh, from diabetes to stomach related issues and numbness. Uh, we need to look at the uh, barriers to the treatment in order to position ourselves to cope uh, and overcome these barriers. The barriers are personal, waiting time, access to treatment, access uh, up to time treatment, financial, caregiver, and uh, several others. So how to support the patient? The primary source of information should be a reliable one, and the patients go back to their doctors and ask uh, information uh, that we see the most frequent. But the thing is that 60% of our patients go to their doctors and ask information, but 70% of this 60% are not very happy with the information they, they get from the they're, they're doctors. So there's a sort of miscommunication, actually. It's not the doctors uh, are giving the wrong information. It's not that there's a gap uh, of communication between the patient and the healthcare professionals. So in a hospital setting, there are a lot of uh, support services around the patient. And as you can see at the bottom, patient uh, organization support is uh, one of the most prominent service that patients uh, are, are utilizing, apart from the, the, the others, including the spiritual support in, in many hospitals. So uh, our members uh, are not homogeneous. I mean, some members are doing only online work, some are uh, going on site, and some are doing both. And those are the diverse uh, services that Lymphoma Coalition members, 71 members, uh, are are uh, serving to their individual patients. Relationship with healthcare professionals should improve. That's what we thought. That's uh, the reason we intended to, to develop a standard of excellence uh, program. But 
uh, through this program, uh, it's not only the communication between healthcare professionals, but uh, among all the stakeholders uh, should be improved. So key to success is to change the status and raise your standards. And uh, by the standard of excellence program uh, that is still uh, under development, we're going to create a professionalism that will bring the credibility and trust and respect, which will render uh, a better communication uh, to better collaborate. And this is the uh, summary of the standard of excellence program, which will provide uh, patients with the information uh, and the support they need. Standard of Excellence uh, program has uh, four pillars. Uh, these e-modules are governance, information standards, organizational process, and continuity planning, financial uh, accountability, and fundraising. Uh, we're going to give courses on these e-modules, and at the end of each e-module, we're going to offer an examination and those who qualify, we're going to have a stamp on their website saying that uh, with this model they have uh, a sort of certificate uh, that they are uh, eligible to talk, uh, maybe officially or more uh, credibly with the stakeholders. I'm going to pass this. So by raising the standards uh, of patient organizations, all stakeholders will work in real to achieve the goals of having common agendas of why, what, uh, how, and what for the patients in real. Actually, we live in boxes in our lives, and, and, and our organizations are living in boxes. Each wall of the box is a, can be considered as a sort of boundary or a norm or a standard. These walls, uh, these norms and standards are physical boundaries, legal boundaries, technical boundaries, financial boundaries, human resources boundaries, etc. But in a study it has been shown that 97% of the people are working within the norms. And when you work within the norms, you get normal results because you work within the standards, you get standard results. So does that mean that majority is wrong? So if you ask a brain scientist, what is the purpose of thinking? Because I work in neurosciences years ago. They would say, do I still have time? Or, okay. So if you ask a neuroscientist, uh, what is the purpose of thinking? He would say, the purpose of thinking is stop thinking. What does that mean? Thinking is a highly energy requiring process. So the brain automatically tries to think as short as possible to save the energy. And then we, we transform into autopilot. Like you're driving, but you don't remember most of the times you're talking or you're doing, you're thinking something else, etc. You don't know what you exactly did because you're on autopilot. So now you're listening to me. Maybe some of you are on autopilot, and I know who you are. So stopping thinking is a sort of tunnel vision. It's on autopilot. Autopilot means you, when you're working on autopilot too much, that means you're thinking very little. And it is the art of science of doing nothing. You pretend to work, but you don't have an impact, really. So people, as well as organizations, when they are stuck, when they hit the wall, they sometimes do less of the same thing or more of the same thing. But it's very rare that they do different things. And it's the same for patient centricity because it's been two decades that we're discussing over and over and over and we don't have an impact on patients' lives, on patient uh, centricity. So we need to do sort of extraordinary things and break the norms and the box. Being in the third person and doing the different, the massive, innovative things that comes with e-health is very important. Breaking norms and standards to achieve extraordinary goals for the benefit of patients. That is a choice which is completely yours. So just some uh, food for thought. 
for uh, the e-health community uh, to see where uh, e-health community fit in our uh, work. How can e-health uh, help shape and how we communicate together and share information among each other globally? Are there portals and communication streams we could be using, we should be using as a global body? How do we get information uh, to patients differently or better, especially in the light of uh, doctors and, and industry who are not very willing to communicate with patients and patient organizations? And what are the other industries doing in this area that are global? So I cut it short. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, here's my email for you to, to communicate. Thank you so much.